Hello there. Hello and uh, welcome to our workshop on communication and aid in a digital age, um, which is presented by the CNET network and is part of WISIS 2021. So while we have our um, attend attendees and panelists um, get ready and settled, we will start with a video from WISIS about this event. The World Summit on the Information Society 2021 has begun and is off to an exciting start, having already hosted several as well as receiving a record number of submissions for the WISIS prizes, with 1,270 projects submitted, you have until March 31st to vote for your favorite ICT for Development projects. As the forum progresses, we encourage stakeholders to keep an eye out on our interactive agenda for announcements about exciting workshops and our various ICT for Development related special tracks, many of which have already been inaugurated successfully, such as the ICTs and Gender Mainstreaming track, the ICTs for Wellbeing and Happiness track, as well as the ICTs and Accessibility for Persons with Disabilities and Pacific Needs track. In addition, we are pleased to have opened our high-level track on March 22, 2021, which featured the appointment of the 2021 WISIS Forum Chairman. Policy sessions featured during the high-level track will be moderated by high-level track facilitators, Nominated by the WISIS stakeholders during the open consultation process, these sessions will gather over 100 high-ranking officials of the WISIS stakeholder community, with over 35 ministers, deputies, ambassadors, and more than 30 heads of regulatory bodies, private sector, civil society, academia, and the technical community. Many other exciting tracks will open soon, such as the opening of the ICTs and Youth track, the opening of the Cybersecurity track, as well as the Emerging Technologies for Sustainable Development track all of which you can find more information about on our interactive agenda and website. In addition to these exciting tracks, building on the title of this year's forum, ICTs for Inclusive, Resilient, and Sustainable Societies and Economies, we're hosting a series of related workshops, including our series of bi-weekly workshops where stakeholders from around the world demonstrate how they're using ICTs to fight back against the coronavirus pandemic. The work of our stakeholders will also be displayed on our virtual exhibition space that was inaugurated on March 15th, 2021, Various other networking and social events will also be integrated into the forum, with meet and greet opportunities and frequent social media posts and engagements, as well as engagements during internationally recognized UN days and weeks. In addition, registration for the Aging Better with ICT's Hackathon is now open, and the hacking has begun, with more than 650 registrants participating. In addition to this exciting hackathon, we're pleased to announce that the WISIS Forum special track on ICTs and older persons will be initiating a special prize this year, entitled the WISIS Healthy Aging Innovation Prize. Call for submissions are still open, and we encourage you to submit related projects to this exceptional prize. We look forward to your participation, and thank stakeholders for their contribution in shaping this year's WISIS Forum with commitment and ongoing support. We received more than 500 inputs and suggestions from stakeholders worldwide to shape the agenda and program of the WISIS Forum 2021 during virtual discussions and direct official submissions to the open consultation process. We are delighted to see well-balanced contributions in terms of geographical location, gender balance, and stakeholder type, which has shown the positive commitment towards the WISIS process and the strengthening of WISIS implementation activities to achieve the sustainable development goals. We would also like to extend a warm thank you to our partners without whom this forum would not be possible. Thank you, and we look forward to a successful 2021 WISIS Forum. The world. Thank you, and I um, hope you, hope you um, enjoy that video and um, give you more information about WISIS and the forum. So just to welcome, welcome to this, this is a session on communication and aid in, in the digital age. Um, it's hosted by uh, CDAC Network. CDAC is a network of UN agencies and NGOs working together to improve communication and accountability with affected persons and humanitarian responses. And we are bring together thought leaders. We bring together we bring together best practices, and we share them amongst our network. So, my I am the um, director for capacity bridging and technology, which leads us to this session on digital communications. So looking forward, looking back in the last five years, we've been promised a communications revolution based on cheap, affordable digital communication technologies, social media, peer-to-peer -peer messaging, and the switch from top-down communication, humanitarian responses, to more peer-to-peer -peer communication, allowing people to talk together. 
So this has, of course, been massively um, you know, expanded in the last 12 months by COVID-19, when pretty much you know, most of the world has had to rely far more on digital communication than before. So how has these things changed things? So we're going to discuss this today with our, with our panel. And um, um, so I just introduced our panel here. So we're looking at the, how things are changing. And joining me to discuss this is um, Tite Ilua, who's Accountability and Gender Advisor for Save the Children International. Um, she joined Save the Children in 2016 as the Accountability and Gender Accountability Advisor. Um, she ensures that multiple and appropriate channels of communication exist between Save the Children, its partners, and the affected population, and that they are appropriate and all, irrespective of their gender, age, and vulnerability status. Um, she's here to talk about a project in Nigeria, which she headed up, piloting the use of digital voice recorders to increase community engagement and feedback. Um, also joining us is An Andrew Bredenkamp, technology lead and board member for Translators Without Borders, a board chair since 2015 and now leading innovation in language technology for TWB, with a background in technology and a PhD in natural language processing and a founder of a technology company. He has worked closely with TWB programs in Bangladesh, Nigeria and DRC. Mike Adams, is the international coordinator of First Response Radio. First Response Radio responds to disasters by setting up an emergency radio station in a suitcase within 24 hours. So these are suitcase, suitcase radios with everything in them. FOR teams have responded to nearly 40 disasters in six countries in Asia and Africa. And Mike started First Response Radio in 2004 in response to the Boxing Day tsunami and still continues to lead it 16 years later. Talib Butsweski, um, it's the Associate Innovation Officer with UNHCR Innovation, uh, Associate Innovation Officer working on digital CWC and AAP programs based in Asia and the Pacific region as part of UNHCR's digital inclusion program. She works with country teams more broadly on innovation and in an accountability to affected persons. UNHCR's digital inclusion program aims to ensure that refugees and communities that host them have the right and the choice to be included in a connected mm -hmm. society. So that's our panel. So, so let's, let's move on and discuss the first thing, which is that I think the importance is that good communications and good resilience doesn't actually start with the moment of a humanitarian emergency. It quite often starts before that. And I think, Tala, you have some thoughts on that, don't you? Thanks for the introduction, Fanman. And yeah, definitely. I mean, resilience and preparedness, these are very kind of like broad words and, and hugely important to, to be able to actually effectively communicate with communities um, during our disaster. Um, and also, this is not just kind of like how should organizations prepare to be able to communicate before a disaster, but then while communicating with communities, how is this helping um, people to, to build their own resilience so that they can participate in um, the different um, communication ecosystems that they, that they choose? So as you mentioned, yeah, we've been promised a, a kind of like a digital communications revolution and there's so many different channels out there for, for people to, to engage with and, and use. Um, and so the way that people experience them in, in different contexts can be um, very, very different. So as part of that preparedness is for um, the responsibility of organizations to identify what these different channels are, what it is that people prefer to use, what are they most comfortable with and, and have um, safe um, and, and consistent access to, um, and really getting to know what, what are the experiences from the perspective of, of people. Um, so as, as UNHCR has um, done a, a study on this, particularly um, in East Africa, on kind of like particularly on risks and, and how it is that people can uh, engage with different um, digital channels. So part of that preparedness is understanding these, understanding the, the context so that um, when organizations use digital tools and digital communication channels, um, they can do so safely um, in kind of like the best um, channels that people will choose, um, but then also proactively engage with people to, to learn how to safely use them. For example, if it's well known that um, kind of like resettlement scams or, or um, identity theft are, are common in some areas, then um, it's essential to be aware of these risks and how we can mitigate them and engage with people about this so that they know um, how they could potentially address these themselves so in future um, they can use these different um, communication channels to, to access the information that they want and the channels that they choose instead of waiting for um, you know organizations to communicate in whichever way an organization has, has chosen to do so. 
Yes, and this this kind of this kind of preparedness, this kind of actually knowledge and using work, this is actually critical. Andrew, I take it to translate about borders recognizes that um, with language, this preparation is is even more important sometimes. Uh, yes, thank you, Ahmed. The the, uh, the the technology aspect to it. Um, there, I think mean, there are two aspects to this. The first, uh, as we think about communicating with people in their own language or in languages that they that that are that are really going to be effective to communicate, there are two aspects to this. The first one is to um, uh, prioritize in advance of a of a of a situation the collection of data on people's languages and communication needs. So understanding. Um, uh, which languages are spoken where, um, and what the um, what the channels are, what the levels of literacy are. How do we reach uh, How do we reach people? Not to think of people as a as communities as one homogeneous block, but to think of the uh, um, the differences in communication needs of uh, of the genders of the old and young, uh, of the disabled, etc. So to think of all of those things, what do we need to communicate effectively with people in terms of language and, and, and technology and channels? The second part is obviously the use of language technology uh, cannot be just magicked up. Everyone's used to having uh, voice recognition or uh, chatbots or social media monitoring or machine translation in English and French and, uh, uh, and Spanish and Arabic. But of course, this doesn't exist. These technologies do not exist for, um, uh, for, for marginalized languages. They may exist in some form for, uh, for regional languages, but the more local you go, the less likely it is that those technologies will already exist. So we need to be, what, what we're doing is building um, in advance of, the, of, 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 of crisis situations, we're building um, uh, technology for under-resourced languages to be able to provide those technologies very quickly. Yes, and I'm, I'm, and and I was to say that you mentioned there about languages. We need to be aware of it. And the fact that there's very few countries monolingual. Um, Tete, in I take it that's something you are personally experienced in Nigeria. I mean, Nigeria has an official language, of course, but um, I take it that for you to be able to your technology use is directly depends on you know, was influenced by the multiple languages there. Exactly. Um, so in Nigeria, we have um, multiple languages, especially in the northeast um, of Nigeria. And that's why we always put into consideration to ensure that we get suitable channels of communication. And that channel must also put in, uh, bear in mind that um, there are multiple languages. So it's pretty important that whatever channel we have decided to choose will be channels that will be uh, comfortable for the users, for the affected population, and they're able to communicate in these multiple languages. And in that saying, we also ensure that these channels are pretty appropriate for all genders, for all age, and all people of different vulnerability status. And also ensuring that we look at their literacy level also, which is pretty important to us. So I would say being ready to communicate also means that being able to identify suitable channels, one being able to be flexible, to use different um, multiple channels to ensure that uh, no one is left behind. So we usually in Save the Children leverage on existing channels that exist in communities, whether we want to adopt them, whether we want to adapt them, or we don't want to create new ones, but we ensure that we do so safely and in a confidential manner. Thank you. And that, of course, I'll take it today, really influenced your choice of an audio technology for this, I take it. Exactly. Yes, I thought so. And of course, when it comes to audio technologies, um, radio is always there, it's been around for a long time. But, but Mike, I, you know, when it comes to beyond language and research, there's other ways of preparation before you use any technology. It's also required, I take it. Yes, yeah, so our goal is to get a radio station on the air in 72 hours after a disaster. This happened just recently in the Philippines with a recent typhoon. Um, the station is on the air in an affected uh, disaster zone and, and within 72 hours. And, and people look at us and say, that's amazing. Like, that, that's so great that you're so fast. But fast didn't start yesterday. <laughs> fast started years ago. Uh, when we began equipping and training local teams. And so that's our, our mantra. We equip, we train, we respond. And so the resilience part, it's like Andrew said, you have to start way before the disaster to be really ready for the disaster. And because we're equipping and training uh, local teams, 
uh, very localized. This means we're using local languages and we're creating local capacity. When this idea came up 16 years ago and we started imagining developing radio in disaster zones, we imagined a fly-in capacity that came internationally into the country, but clearly that wasn't gonna work with all the languages. We, we face the same problem uh, TJ mentioned. In India, we've got a Northern team and a Southern team because there's very little crossover in the languages. In the Philippines, a Northern and Southern team for all the regional languages. So creating local capacity, equipping and training before disaster means that we're there and really ready when the disaster strikes. And of course, not just that, with radio and a lot of communication technologies, regulations and the amount of paperwork required must be phenomenal. So we, sp we, we spend our time before disasters, even in our training events pre-disaster, in building relationships, yes, with the government, regulatory authorities, all the other partners, the community engagement community um, in that country. Radio can never work independently. It's always working with partners. So the, the training time, the preparation time, we're building those relationships. We're building that network of relationships to be able to be on the ground. Uh, our teams make it look easy, but it started years before. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Um, I just want to, want to open this up as well to the audience um, listening that um, we're really interested in hearing your thoughts and in particular answering your questions. So if you hear anything or, or, you, have a, or you need clarification on anything or you have the comment, please do just drop them in the chat, send us, send us a question, and we'll come to them as they come in and we'll, we'll incorporate them into our call. So, so please just feel free to just um, write in the chat and ask us any questions. So the points, a couple of points that were raised earlier, um, Lisa needs to think that it is really important not just to go in there and just work. We Preparation basically means that there exists an infrastructure, there exists communication channels, there exists you know, a lot of the places we go to are well before humanitarian aid was needed, people were communicating anyway. So uh, how important, Tala, is it to work with communication channels and the way people work uh, that's already there? Um, well, I mean, think that um, kind of like using the, the, the channels and the networks that are already on the ground is absolutely essential to actually have effective communication. Um, in, a, um, in a disaster situation, like, like humanitarian organizations do not operate in a, in a vacuum it's not like you know everything has been just right need to come in like parachute your own solution there's already things on the ground there there's networks and there's people there's sources that um that uh, people from different groups already already trust and will be the sources of information that they go to to get um whatever information it is that they're wanting to communicate with um their family members um or other people um so really um for to to communicate effectively in, in humanitarian settings, then it's really about seeing kind of like what is already there, what are the different um, uh, networks that humanitarian organizations could partner with um, or, or support, uh, so that communication is more kind of like peer-to-peer -peer rather than necessarily coming from uh, humanitarian organizations, because um, like generating that, that level of, of trust can take a very long time to really generate. So it's more about seeing kind of like what is already there and how can we, um, as, as organizations, how can we support it? So for example, um, Facebook groups or, or WhatsApp um, groups uh, are hugely popular in, in so many places. So while you recognize that, okay, Facebook is maybe a, a communication channel that people are happy to use, it's not about setting up your own Facebook group to deliver whatever information you want. It's about seeing like maybe you can support um, either a youth group or a women's group to and see if they already have a Facebook group and see how you can support them with um, information, for example, particularly in the COVID situation with rumors and misinformation being such a, a massive challenge. It's seeing like, how can you help them provide um, accurate information to, to their peers um, on this instead of kind of like setting up your own satellite thing and then having to work a huge amount to try to get people onto your channel because that's um, not really going to, to happen. Um, so you see, what channels are people already using? Who do they trust? But at the same time, having to be very, very aware about who is not represented in these groups. So while we're talking about digital communication channels and it might be um, have a huge reach, there's obviously a digital gender divide that cannot be ignored. Um, perhaps there's some marginalized groups that are either not on these channels or their voices are not heard through these channels. Um, 
So, you know, there's not always going to be perfect that you find a network that reaches everybody. It's saying who is excluded and who, how you can work with them to make sure that those voices are reached um, and they can reach um, further their, um, their peers. Um, so, yeah, well, we recognize that. Um, what's that Facebook other messaging apps can be um, can be hugely helpful as who is not on them and what risks could they potentially pose to, to people so that when you we choose a channel that reaches a lot of people like WhatsApp is not going like well WhatsApp is great because it reaches these many people is like yes but then how do we also do this safely and, and being able to reach um, those who are not yet on it thanks yeah I mean that that is interesting especially the rise of WhatsApp that people using peer-to-peer communication but there is a danger there sometimes, maybe the fact that people then start thinking about using digital um, apps and digital channels, people like, but then of course, we naturally default to English and that can be a real problem, can't it, Andrew? Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think also people are, uh, are um, to some extent in the digital world used to um, uh, having to communicate in, uh, in, in major languages rather than being able to communicate in their own. So it's a real opportunity. Language is a real opportunity to create more engagement and more, um, and more connection. Um, unfortunately, it's been one that, that has been slow to take up. We still see in many regions people, uh, people thinking that they can run digital campaigns in English or French or uh, or, or a, um, a, a major global language rather than taking mm. the time to, to, to work on the, uh, to understand what the languages are that needed for successful communication. Um, uh, but I totally agree with Tala. I think what we need to go, we need to find that balance between going where people are, where the conversations are happening and where people are, are, are comfortable speaking. And at the same time, balance that with, um, with the marginalized uh, uh, people uh, who don't have access to uh, to those channels? So we do a lot of radio. We do a lot of um, uh, work on SMS and, and other channels to make sure that we can reach with the technology approaches. We can reach as many as many people as possible. On on the language side, um, you know, it's really important to understand that that as I say, this is not just a a, a, a community of people who all speak one language, but it's. Um, it's a, it's much more nuanced than that. Uh, the you know the educational levels, the uh, the access to technology and connectivity will different will will vary for different demographics within a um, within a community, and we need to take those seriously if we want to reach um, uh, uh, reach the most marginalised who usually have the most constraints on 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 how they get information. And Andrew, I know that um, TWB have some technology, you know, when they do translations, it's not just people writing pieces of paper, They're, they have software tools and things, which we'll come across later that you use that for translation, right? Absolutely. We, so we use a whole range of technology. We don't just, we're not just translating one piece of one document to another. We do visual design posters and, and we do software localization for apps and uh, we build voice technology into other people's technologies um, and approaches. So the, it's, um, uh, yeah, the translators in the name doesn't really cover the range of, of activities that are involved in in solving the language challenge and the the effective communication challenge uh, that that we see, I mean, I think it's really important to realise that um, when it comes to digital technologies, new technologies for communication, it's not just using that commercially available WhatsApp and using the the other technologies that assist community engagement, like translation tools. And and I think we go to Tete, you you know, you know using digital. It was, it, was, it was the fact that literacy and the fact that it's a verbal, multiple verbal environment that, that drove you to use a technological solution to an age-old problem of, of feedback, right? Exactly. Um, so like you said, uh, language barrier, we had people speaking multiple languages, poor connectivity made us look into other um, channels in which we could communicate with children, with communities. And that led to us thinking about um, using simple devices like uh, voice recorders, uh, which allowed um, children, adults um, of different um, um, gender to, to communicate to us in their languages. So that helped to, to eliminate the language barrier in, in, in lots of ways. And even thinking about the co connectivity, I must say that we also have different channels. For example, we do have a toll free line that, I mean, if the connectivity were good, um, people can actually pick up their phone to call. But when there are barriers like languages and like um, poor connectivity, uh, 
other channels need to come into play. And that's why the voice recorder came into play in, in Save the Children. So we piloted it in a few communities in the northeastern part of Nigeria. And if you're familiar with the northeastern part of Nigeria, you'd know that um, connectivity is a problem. Language barrier is also a problem. I'm talking about the literacy level also. Um, so findings, the recent findings that we, we did uh, kind of showed that um, the introduction of this voice recorder increased communication with the affected population, with children, with adults, with the vulnerable ones, um, and also increase their participation. We saw increase in different sort of information given to us, sensitive and unsensitive, via the voice recorder. And especially because they felt that um, it's quite easy for them, they could just pick it up. And let me say that, as Tala mentioned, one um, channel does not fit all. One channel cannot totally address everybody. And that's why there is room for using multiple um, channels. There was a time we did find out that this first mm -hmm. recorder, um, few children were using it at some point within the face of this, um, the introduction. We realized that children felt that it was basically for adults. And that was another reason why we had to consult with children again and explain to them. And that actually boosted the use of this. So we see information coming from children, from adults, from girls, boys of different vulnerability status. So it was a very um, big plus addition to us. And um, we are looking to scaling it up into, into different communities, into more communities in, in, in days to come. Thank you. Yes, and then, and I and I'd want to keep keep on that point of engaging communities, especially because when it comes to um, working with with communities, it's not you know it's it, again before you know for the technology to work well, you also need to understand how it, how the technology could work with the community, and when it comes to radio, I think Mike, um, you 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 mentioned you know before about uh, about the preparation, but also sort of knowing about. Um, just the way people talk and when you do radio it's interesting that fact that you know people think of it as you know blasting out information but it's not quite like that is it you need to understand how people what you know how people prefer to hear things how prepared to work with things so yes we were talking about both preferred channels and then how that channel works so i would say the same thing as all the other panelists and we look ahead at where radio is where there is a listening community already and some areas the cdac community has mapped people's preferred channels and radio features highly in some areas like in the philippines and some rural areas uh, in india um floods in bihar a uh, very rural illiterate poor people, really radio was their main number one preferred uh, channel. And so we knew that like our presence there was really appropriate. So we do look that radio uh, is and can be used in a community. And even if there are, there's no history of radio listening, but everything else is down, we distribute uh, the handheld radio receivers uh, in the thousands so that we can, we can provide or replace that missing part of the communications link that Sometimes if there is no other channel of communications, even if they're not regularly radio listeners, they will use it in times of disaster when you have the information they need. But you're right, um, some people, uh, some agencies think about radio just for getting their message to the community, uh, for messaging, for informing, for educating, but it uh, really can and should be a, a two-way uh, tool. Uh, yes, we broadcast publicly, but we need to find ways to hear back from the community. And so we have a range of different radio formats where people express their opinions, call in, give questions. The next time you talk to the government or the health minister or whatever, please ask them this and this. That, that uh, many times we find that our radio programs are uh, are formatted by what the questions that people give us and how we can best answer those questions. So we we think of radio as uh, you know um, informing and educating, but really uh, in pre-disaster, non-disaster times, people will turn turn to it for entertainment. And it's still uh, the role of radio to entertain is still a very legitimate role, even in disasters, because it will help people's mental health. It helps people return back to normal. People even want to hear the, you know, the, 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 the sports scores, the football scores and things like that, even just as they're coming out of a disaster. Anything that helps make them feel like we're coming back to normal was found to be um, super helpful in some previous very stressful disasters. So we look at uh, where radio is a good channel, but we recognize there's many different 
formats for radio programming. And we need to like just switch off the information and uh, allow people to relax and enjoy and connect with their community also, that there's many different reasons for using radio. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. And we've had some, Mike, um, if you uh, just stay on. Uh, we had a quest, quick, couple of quick questions from um, coming. First of all, Mike, um, when you are working on a response and preparing, the question is, how do you identify, how do you know who to train in, in an area of thousands of people? Um, how do you do that? Okay, so we uh, we will train with local partners. So we're, we're connected to a local radio network. Um, uh, Far East Broadcasting is our partner in many of the countries you know, the, and places that we work in. And so they will have existing radio stations, existing uh, skilled radio journalists. And so their day job is regular radio broadcasting. And then they're, they're like the volunteer fireman who puts on the first response radio you know, hat. Uh, and so we will, uh, we will look to local radio partners, but we will also use the local communications community to identify humanitarians and, and government responders so that we get a really good mix of uh, government and NGO a response community and our radio journalist people because they learn uh, from each other. So we will, uh, we will draw from our local partners and have them engage with their, their partners as well to find candidates to fill courses. And this is a question to everybody um, from, from our audience, which is the question of trust. I mean, how do you build trust um, with the you know, existing channels is one thing, but how do you build, build trust within this existing channel? So, um, and also how do you include people? So we're saying we're talking about including people with existing channels. How do we include them in the way we work? How do we include them in the design of these channels? So I'm open this up, perhaps um, who would like to start? Any hands? Okay, Andrew. Um, <laughs> Andrew, then Tilin, then Hala. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I th thank you. I think um, I, I think a key part of trust is is uh, is having a two way conversation. Um, I, I think one of the opportunities that technology offers us is to is to be doing more listening uh, than than we've been doing in the past, and um, uh, to try to think of ways in which we can look for those signals, whether it's social media monitoring or engaging in uh, with conversational AI, we can increasingly have more intelligent, more, more uh, conversational experiences inside chatbots. We can use all of this technology to listen more and, and it's no good just listening. We also have to respond. So um, mm -hmm. what, what we've been working on is, is um, using the insights we get from conversations to, uh, to have editorial calls with our partners on where are the content gaps? Where are the challenges where people are asking for, for asking about things where we're not able to give answers so that we can start to address those content gaps? We had a, 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 some interesting cases with, with our COVID-19 work where pe um, we hadn't planned for uh, the fact that there was a lot of concern by, from young mothers about the, the effects of their children and how they should, they should work in terms of prevention uh, with uh, with their young family, so we quickly were able to build that content into the conversation and, and respond to it. And I think as soon as you can listen, and as soon as people see that you you don't just listen but you respond to to, to feedback, um, that is a wonderful way of building trust. And I think the second thing is is obviously the language piece. People are are so um, much more open and engaged when when they're able to speak in a language that they that they feel comfortable in. And Tete, you want to add in um, as well? Yes, let me just um, pick on Andrew's um, thought there on um, the language bits. That was one uh, quick lesson we learned in like, the first um, year of developing accountability system, that people feel much comfortable um, when they speak in their own language. So the trust actually comes in. Coming to what I was going to say, so for us to end trust in the first instance, we like to ensure that we communicate with them. So in the first instance, they will be the one to choose the most appropriate channel that they think they wanna receive their information from or they wanna give us feedback um, on, which is quite important. How do we even do that? Before we do that, we ensure that we have a pure good mapping of people that exist in that community so that when we um, bring up people 
the, the representation of people that would respond to us would be a very pure representative of, of the community. So we're not leaving anybody out. We would have partnered with um, organizations, with people living with disability, probably women organization, youth organization. So when we are consulting, we ensure that all those people are involved. So um, if we're choosing one channel, it will be because that is the preferred channel across board. If you're picking three, it's because that will be the preferred channel across board. So that's quite important. I also jotted down that um, if you want to hear from people, you need to be able to uh, respond to them. And that's closing the feedback loop for us. It's pretty important. We have come to realize that that's one way in which you can easily lose people's trust. Um, so I have told you what has happened. What have you done? So if they don't have um, a pure trust in your system, oh, then you would lose them. And that's it. Um, I also did say that, um, or did put down that monitoring is also very good, which is also a way in which we would usually know that, okay, um, something is wrong somewhere. I'd just like to reiterate that, um, a channel might be appropriate now, might not be appropriate in the next um, three months or four mm -hmm. months. For example, when COVID hit, there were a lot of um, channels for us that weren't deemed um, appropriate at that time. So um, just saying monitoring, monitoring in a way that is, it, is, the, is the channel still effective? And how do we monitor? We also like to hear from them. So we will hear from this representation of the community too, um, the CVs, the community volunteers, the um, youth boys, girls, are uh, this channel still appropriate for you? Are we resolving your um, feedback as we should? Are there things we, so, we, we should add on to it? Um, I think if we keep doing that, um, the trust and the proximity to people will continue to build up and right. um, it will be there. Thank you. Yeah, that's, 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 that's great. I mean, I hope that answered that, that question. We need to move on, move on because, oh, Tala, sorry, very quickly, Tala. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be um, quick because of the time. Um, but I mean, I, I completely echo the, the comments on how important closing the feedback loop is and how important it is to um, make sure that like, you, if, if you're receiving feedback, you have to not only do something about it, but tell people what it is that you have done about it. Um, and that again comes back to the point I was making earlier on kind of like using um, the, the channels and networks that people are already in and also um, seeing how you can support those networks to be the ones to communicate because, um, um, you know, with um, with trust, it always being an organization that is communicating might not be really the, the face or voice that people want to hear. So that's why working with um, channels uh, and the communication being done by people themselves with their peers um, is essential. Uh, and I guess just kind of like bringing up the, the last very boring point, I think would be resourcing. Like a lot of the times we think like, you know, digital channels grand they're they're cost less than than face to face um and we have if we have like a, a facebook group or a um a whatsapp channel it will be easier to respond but also often comes in hand with um receiving a load more inquiries because maybe there's more people that can access it so even though none of us like hearing about budgets then it's really making sure that if you are going to open these channels you need to be prepared to receive a huge number of inbound queries, questions, and have the capacity to respond to them. Because if you're like, well, great, come to our radio shows or our Facebook group, and you don't have the, the means to reply to any of them, that can um, seriously impact um, trust. So how do you direct them to, to existing um, services or, or how do you respond to them is, is essential for, for planning and the use of these channels. That's great, Tyler. And I disagree with you in the sense that that's not interesting. That was utterly fascinating because <laughs> I think with the audience we have here, right, cost benefit analysis, the idea that an um, uh, upfront capital cost and investment and community engagement will lead to longer, you know, you know, you know, you know more efficient use of resources in the, in the long run. It's time for uh, maybe it's time in community engagement. We look at whole life costs. This is the whole thing about the whole life costs. It's not just the it's like, you know, buying an electric car, expensive to start with very cheap to keep running, whole life cost project. I think that's something uh, something worth our audience considering, which is, and at the end of the day, I think funding and money is something everybody's interested in. So I think that was a very interesting point indeed. So moving on to, um, we, um, we have some more questions. We, we will come back to the questions, but I wanna, um, I think the next topic will, will relate to this um, is, is also, we've got the background, we understood the channels, we understand it's whole life cost. So now we talk about the technology itself and the idea that using the right technology can also be efficient and increase your engagement. It's the way we think about it and the way we use it. And I think I'll start with Andrew here about the kind of technology that TWB is using 
um, that's pushing it beyond, um, maybe beyond some people are thinking right now. So, so Andrew, could you tell us a bit, a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, happy to. I, I mean, I would agree with uh, the, uh, picking up the comment a bit from Titi before and the, the, uh, the using the right technology for the, for the right job. We've also been uh, very keen uh, to do the research uh, and not but not just do some research and then march on uh, um, with with that but to be constantly listening uh, looking for signals from people looking for feedback looking for which channels are working um, and uh, and and where and um, we've certainly learned that uh, it's it, it's abs it's really important to be uh, to be flexible with respect to the uh, the approaches you want to take. Um, so we've, uh, we know that in certain areas where we're active, Northeast Nigeria in DRC, uh, there, are situate, there are many uh, contexts where people have limited access to cell phones and uh, internet costs may be high, data costs may be high. Um, and so we need, to, we need to have low tech and high tech solutions. We also have voice recorders in camps in Northeast Nigeria. Um, and uh, are, are using technology to then uh, automate the process of transcribing those in local languages. Um, uh, to Tala's point, being able to respond to the data you collect is really, really important. Um, and so low tech solutions, we're now building a second generation of that kind of concept with the voice enabled uh, um, uh, screens, which you can talk to. Uh, and they will give you information about certain topics uh, in your again all in 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 local languages. And, and then this right is your chatbot technology the, is it, Andrew? That's your so chatbot the, technology. Uh, uh, no, in, in the 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 voice enabled kiosks, if you like, is a, is another concept that we call tiles, which is really a, a tablet that you can speak to in your own language, and it will give it will interact with you not by having a conversation, but it will it will give you content based on, on what you say. So it can be, it, at, the, at the start, it can be simple keyword spotting uh, to say, tell me, about, uh, tell me about safety or tell me about uh, food deliveries. If you're, in a, if you're in a camp situation, tell me about how to find my family or schools or, and you can then give people information in their own language. So it's interactive, but it's not conversational in that sense. And then the next step would be um, conversational AI where we're trying, we're using chatbots to have conversations with people two-way conversations where we're listening as well as speaking. And the final step is machine translation that again, people know from Google Translate and, 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 and Microsoft and others. Um, but, but as we, each step adds more richness to the technology to the point where we can start to provide machine translation, which is really then giving people full access to, uh, to, to content. Um, and so we see it starting with very simple voice enabled things then conversational interactive things with chatbots and then machine translation on this sort of incremental path as we get more interactions going. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's really a question of at the same time, keeping this very aligned with the programs that are us and that we and our partners are running to make sure that what we're doing actually has impact. And it's not just, we're not just deploying a technology because we think it's cool and we want to try it out, but it's actually having impact. And in terms of uh, driving conversations, driving engagement, and and and, and having that um, having that impact on the on the programs itself. Yeah, that's really interesting indeed because that that driving access, I think it's it's a key part of what Save the Children are doing in Nigeria. I mean, the, the technology was chosen because it allowed increase in access, as particularly also uh, with gender. I remember you mentioning so so Titi, can you tell us about? I mean, this is actually a question from one of our audience about how this technology helps a pre you know, how do you approach you know, marginalized groups and things like that. So tell us about how it helped you using technology, especially with terms of gender and other uh, other groups. Today. Right. So, um, like, like I said, we, we chose it basically because um, we consulted with um, different groups and we realized that this one um, connectivity was a problem and two language barrier. And so we decided to go with this um, and it was a joint um, decision, actually. So in that way, once we decided to use this one, uh, we had set it up. We also trained. Um, different um, groups of people on it, on how to use it and what would happen um, eventually. And that always also means that there are times when um, they might leave messages anonymously, which is also good. And I would also say that 
this channel is usually used in com um, combination with um, sort of feedback meetings to, to deal with um, um, information that's coming anonymously and we feel that it should be addressed. So those are things that we might um, talk about during feedback meeting in that community, hoping that we are still able to close the loop, even though we do not have um, the, the individual that has given us that information. And so let me just say that even with the voice recorder, we do realize that there are things that we can also still do better, there are ways in which we can um, improve on it. And like Andrew said, um, there are layers to it. So we have provided the voice recorder, um, people would go in and um, give their messages there, uh, but we still physically retrieve that device to download the messages um, and then transcribe them and then respond to um, the individuals. Uh, so looking at it, which was, and I would say this, it was particularly quite stressful during lockdown, COVID-19 lockdown, because we couldn't really physically retrieve this. And so mm -hmm. we had to put different other measures into place. So Save the Children is currently exploring opportunities to see how we could um, probably sync this via the internet um, so that we could just um, get this data without physically um, transcribing or physically retrieving the, the device. And one major barrier to this, I must say, is the poor connectivity in areas, as Andrew said also, um, in the Northeastern Nigeria, uh, the connectivity, if not poor, is probably not in existence. There are places we get to and there are pretty no networks there. So um, we're looking to see if there are um, probably on-site mobile network that could help us achieve, give us a little bit of, um, signal network that we could use mm -hmm. to um, <clears throat> sync this over the internet. So yes, that's what we're doing right. and that's what we're hoping to do in the next phase of this. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting about the fact that it's, it's, a, it's a great technology to open up is voice recording, allow people to speak verbally, it reaches a lot more people, um, there's no need to write, it attacks illiteracy and then collecting the data. But of course the problem with connectivity is still there Issues, and this is okay. interesting because we're talking about technology using using wireless networks. But of course, the oldest wireless network is radio. Mm -hmm. And Mike, I mean, your your background is that. So we think of radio very much as a one way directional tool, but communication now is a two way tool. So so how I mean, how you know how can you tackle that? So yes, uh, both you know the uh, is it. It, is it the uh, best tool or technology for the job? And given its restrictions of being one way, how do we make it two way? So uh, uh, I think that it's, um, we've chosen very traditional radio, um, analog radio, FM transmitters, distributing um, handheld wind up you know, radios to communities to be a very rugged, robust uh, solution. So we've gone for very low tech because low tech equals very robust. It will keep working. Um, we, and we work in a disaster environment, not just in a development world, but we work when everything has fallen apart. So in a disaster world and in a disaster environment, cell phone networks may be down. Um, the places I've gone where I work, they've definitely now been down. And that, uh, that we bring in a complete, even if it's kind of old school technology, we bring a complete standalone solution in with us that it's the radio stations, our own generators, transmitters, antennas, um, radio receivers for the listeners, that, that our, our communication can get to them even when all of the other network is down. And so that's one reason that we like radio being kind of robust and, and uh, sort of old school, but we, we need to hear back from the community. So I, I like what TT is doing. We do that also. We will send our journalists out with um, voice recorders into the community to capture their voice and their questions and bring them back to the station. People are invited to drop into the station. So just physically come in the door of our station and talk to us, record something, let us interview you. Do you want to talk on the air? Um, so we'll physically get people in the door. And have you thought about integrating that with digital technologies? Um, so like WhatsApp, you mean that's, can they, how, that, how is that integrated? So I'd say that we, we, we build on the most robust and rugged technologies. So the next two that I would say are, we use the cell phone voice network, you know, the voice network will come back first. And then the SMS texting comes back before 3G, um, maybe two weeks in a disaster before, you know, the, the internet you know, comes back up. So we will, we will most heavily lean on the tech that we know is gonna be there first or be back first. But then, uh, yes, as 
technology opens up as the infrastructure comes back online, then we would use something That's like that. Um, Facebook groups, you know, WhatsApp groups, uh, what people are using. We just recognize in the places we work and the times that we've responded, a lot of that will be down. And so we start with the most uh, robust, and we, but we will work our way up the technology um, uh, offerings. The, uh, so it's kind of a high-low mix then you're talking about, aren't you, Mike? Yes. So that really much leads to, I think, uh, uh, to uh, the importance of not just using digital and, and technologies or using older technologies. It's the kinds of, they don't replace each other, they complement each other. And Tala, what do you think about the idea? Can you tell us about expand about the idea of, of, of this combination, high low mix of digital, non-digital, new technologies, old technologies? Yeah, I mean, using kind of like a, a mix we think is, is essential. Like this, sometimes digital communications are seen as kind of like, well, this is going to replace face to face. Uh, we're no longer going to have to kind of like physically see people uh, or digital communication is just going to replace all the channels, which is which is very much not the case. So um, a lot of the different work uh, that that we do is just kind of like seeing, OK, so how do we integrate these these new technologies and these new ways of communicating with existing processes and existing ways that people um, want to receive information? or directing to what is a bit more appropriate. So with these technologies, what we see is like the opportunity to enhance coverage, expand reach, or improve the way that we reach different um, community members, and then create the linkages to see what else needs to happen to make it um, more accessible. So I hope this um, also answers a bit of what um, Rochelle's question um, is I was going to come to that, yes. Um, where kind of like, yeah, I mean, for sure, the digital gender divide um, is, a, is a huge challenge. Um, and I think what also sometimes is missing from, from kind of like reports that tell you, well, X percentage of, of women and girls have access to, to mobile phones or to connectivity. Um, the issue of, of private uh, and, and personal access to these things can often be a huge challenge. So it might be that women do have access to a mobile phone, but this is monitored by, by a male guardian of some sort. Or for example, many adolescent girls will have Facebook accounts or have um, a WhatsApp number, but this is monitored by their, their parents. So really do have to see what kind of access people have to these channels and whether they could genuinely use this to communicate perhaps on, on, sensitive, um, uh, on sensitive issues. So that goes back to kind of like the preparedness that we were mentioning at the start, that you really need to see how do people experience these digital channels to see maybe a digital channel could be an entry point and then you direct them elsewhere. So for example, um, um, with a WhatsApp information service that we're, we're piloting, um, it supports reaching people that have WhatsApp and it's kind of like, it helps, I guess, with triage where people can receive information about different services available or um, information of what to potentially do. And that kind of like, um, that provides information that people can access easily on their phone without having to speak to anybody in a channel that is hugely available to lots of people. But then it does also link to other existing things, for example, um, gender-based violence, hot lines um, or it can also kind of like direct you to um, caseworkers so that it then goes like perhaps um, you find this information and you cannot interact further but then you can be directed to for example a phone line um, if you can use that or um, there can be an alert created to see like perhaps you actually do need to meet um, uh, with somebody face to face to be able to um, really have your your question resolved um, so having that very clear linkage between your digital channels and your non-digital ways of working and services is great. Um, it's, it's hugely important and especially having like standard operating procedures of maybe how are you going to manage inbound inquiries that um, a person could have access to social media for a very short window when they're able to access it. So then how do you, um, how do you link back to them maybe through a more appropriate channel that is um, uh, more accessible and safer for them? Thank you. I hope that um, answers some of your questions, Rochelle. Yes, and Tete, um, Tete, I also was wondering about you know, your your the way you've been working has been you mentioned um, is it been particularly useful in reaching um, you know, question about gender you know, you know or gender issues for women? It's it's been useful for letting them access to be involved in part of the feedback and communication system. Yes, so I must say that because I wanted to add to that, um, Tyler said um, yes, it's been pretty. Um, uh, effective in reaching women, especially uh, women and girls, because we know that um, in most cases, that are the ones that are probably might be left out. Um, even people living with disabilities, uh, we've been able to effectively reach them. Um, the data, the, the um, findings that we did recently showed that um, 
there's been increased use of that device um, by women and girls, most especially. Uh, we've had um, a lot of information coming quite sensitive on SGBV on different types that has come in, and which clearly tells us that um, it's quite effective. And I must say that a um, simple question as to where the um, booth should be placed, the, the voice recorder booth should be placed, um, could have also helped us with this because we did consult with uh, women, girls, different um, different people, different groups of people who then told us that, okay, so you have a voice recorder, how is it gonna be like, where are you gonna put it? So I would, um, one of the findings showed that we did put it where it was quite accessible to people and um, especially women, it was located in such a place that they could um, easily go there and use it. Um, the confidentiality nature of it also helped because it's a one person booth. So um, you just go there, pick it up and then you can say whatever you have to say. You do not even have to leave your name to say what you have to say and you get your response. So simple questions as to um, where should this be located? Is, is it a safe place? Can women access it? Can girls access it? Can children access it? Could help to broaden the horizon of, of, of whatever channel or whatever device that um, we have chosen to use. Uh, so thank you. So these questions really need to be built in at the beginning, effectively, then? Yes, at the beginning Absolutely, of the consultation. Yeah. So right. whatever channel has been chosen, you need to ask for. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so we've been talking about all the great ways technology can, can help, but there's also, of course, the, the other thing about technology is it makes data accessible to everyone. Or everything we've been discussing quite often record, recording and saving and using saving all, all kinds of data. And I think I think the fact that data, you know, there is there's definitely an opportunity there, but we also need to make sure to exploit this opportunity safely is important. And Tala, it, it's not, it's, you know, this is actually a critical part of the conversation, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And like this speaks to pretty much all points that we've um, spoken so far today. Um, uh, it fits into kind of like the preparedness, the right channels, because like any any channel that you use um, has its kind of like has its, its different um, data protection risks. Um, and like you, you just have to accept and be, and be prepared that, for example, if you're putting different channels out there, people will use them. And even you say kind of like, OK, well, we don't receive sensitive complaints through through social media. You nonetheless have to be prepared that perhaps you receive a disclosure through Facebook or through WhatsApp because that's what's available. And that's the avenue um, that you've made available. Um, so it's essential to kind of like recognize what the implications of this are and have very clear um, uh, kind of like procedures that all staff are aware of to say kind of like okay well if you receive this through um, a social media channel where it could um, pose different protection risks what do you do how do you refer it um, how do you ensure that the person is able to access the different um, services that they um, that they need um, but not kind of like try to close down that that conversation so it, it is risk um, and but it's something that has to be managed rather than try to be um, shut down so um uh, we've tried to put kind of like a guidance through our, our, our guide on kind of like how to use social media for, for community based protection to say kind of like um, you just have to be prepared for, for this and make sure that you have your, your steps in place to um, protect that data, make sure that it's transferred to a, a secure channel, um, delete anything that could um, be uh, seen as sensitive, and there's just follow up through, through a different channel. So it's um, recognizing that the, the risk is there and how you're going to manage it for all the different channels that you choose to use. That's nice, great. Andrew, any thoughts about any brief thoughts about this? Um, very briefly, yeah. Now we're running out of time. The, the uh, so uh, two things really. I think one is, uh, like Tala says, we we are opening up channels and we have to be extremely careful. The level of jeopardy uh, potentially around uh, 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 around um, be, being careless with with personal identifiable information is much higher than it, it than is typically covered by the rules of GDPR and other and other things. So we have to be extremely careful. We tried initially to avoid it um, uh, and uh, to avoid any personal identifiable information, but as Tala says, that's not always possible. So we, we have to be extremely careful with how we deal with those things. We're in situations increasingly that, for example, the Venezuelan refugee crisis, uh, we're working um, there on supporting that in a number of countries in South America with interactive technology, where we're actually uh, helping to point people um, at, at, uh, at, at information sources and things. So there's very, it's very difficult. The, obviously, the, you can offer more by finding out more about the person you're talking to. And that has to be really carefully, again, it's a balance, you have to be really careful handling it. The second thing I would say very quickly is that 
um, we need to be building language uh, uh, technology. And to do that, we need language data. And we're working uh, internationally with a number of experts on establishing guidelines as to how we can create language data models, which are, um, which are safe with respect to uh, the data that they use um, and, um, and, and, and make sure that none of that leaks out into the, uh, into, into the technology we build. So it's a, it's, it's, there, is a, there are emerging channels challenges constantly, um, but it's an area that we're working very hard to um, uh, to cover all the angles on. Well, I think we've pretty much reached the end of our, our time, but we're going to go around to go around the panel really quickly in one sentence as to summarize your final thoughts about the uh, impact of technology coming going forward. I mean, you know, what do you think? Can you, if I give you, I'm talking now to give you a minute to think about it. So, so in your first minute, I'm going to start um, with Mike in a, in a, in a, in a sentence. Okay, so I think uh, our, our issues related uh, to uh, consent, you know, when you when you come onto my radio station and I interview you live with your microphone, uh, people are quite clear that that what they say is being public. So that's a good thing about radio. People are are, are aware that they uh, the things they sh they share, the opinions, the questions um, are public. We get consent when we when we record. I love radio as an old school technology. You can tell by my gray hair, I'm an old school guy, but it's robust and it's very rugged. And we've used it in earthquakes and tsunamis and disaster zones all over Asia. And it works, the technology works. Right. But for us, the big battle is years before the disaster strikes, when we begin training local teams, our local capacity uh, is is the big part of our success. Our local capacity and our local groups and our local languages is what makes it work. Right. And, um, okay, Mike, I'm going to stop you there so that we because that's a very long sentence. So, Tala, in one sentence, uh, ah. your summary thoughts. Um, I guess I would say, um, you know, t technologies provide both huge, huge opportunities and, and huge challenges that have to be recognized and addressed alongside with them. But the way that these are, are used um, and the challenges addressed has to be from from the perspective of the people who are going to use them um, with all kind of diversity, ages, genders, um, different languages, uh, di different groups completely recognized so that um, in whichever way they're they're used, it's in the way that those people want to use them for the purposes that they want to use them and really be, be led by them. So they choose how to engage through what um, communication channels for the purposes that they want. Great. And Andrew, your one sentence to summarize. Uh, three points. I think uh, right size the technology. So use appropriate technology for the for the context. Uh, local languages, make sure that you take seriously with the, the, need, the communication needs, the language needs of people. And thirdly, I think two-way conversation, two-way interaction is really, really important. And today, your, your, your final one sentence okay. to summarize. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, whether we have chosen to use a digital or non-digital um, channels, um, we should ensure that they are quite appropriate for all groups, um, and we should ensure that they're safe and confidential and um, they have been uh, issues have been addressed and um, feedback loops have been closed after um, such information have been received thank you great thank you very much there now before we go thank you thank you i want to thank all our panelists to mike tala to Tete, and andrew and i will also before we close we have a closing video from our um, great host at WSIS with this fantastic forum to share ideas and the workshop. These, um, hope to, we hope this has been useful, hope it's opened your eyes and we hope you be able to take this away with you if it's your work and we are all here to help you as well. And you feel free to contact us. And, um, and, but before we go, we have a closing video from our WSIS partners. And thank, thank you, everyone. And um, thank you for joining us. 
and we bid you all a very good weekend and a very good day. Thank you for joining the CDAC Communication and the Digital Age.